Fugabe's reign began on April 18th, 1980, and ended on November the 21st, 2017. He was the only leader many Zimbabweans had ever known, presiding over a violently authoritarian regime that ultimately tanked the country's economy and devastated its development prospects. A master manipulator and an expert at pitting political factions and interest groups against each other, he was finally beaten at his own game by Emerson Nangawa, his right-hand man, and a cabal of senior military figures who seized power in a carefully orchestrated and largely non-violent coup. In his first six months in office, the new man in charge has worked hard to portray himself as representing a decisive break from the past, even though he is implicated in some of the worst excesses of the old regime. These include the Guru Hundi massacre of the 1980s, in which the army killed tens of thousands of members of the Dembele ethnic group, and the 2008 election violence in which pro-Mugabe forces targeted loyalists of opposition candidate Morgan Sangarai, ultimately forcing him to withdraw from the race. Among other decrees, Zimbabwe's new 75-year-old president has relaxed restrictions on freedom of speech, allowed opposition parties to campaign openly in rural areas, relaxed restrictions on white farmers owning land, legalised cannabis production for medical use, and ordered the police to stop extorting motorists at checkpoints. He has toured the world declaring that Zimbabwe is open for business and relaxed restrictive indigenization laws to attract foreign investment. Very pleasing to the US State Department. His portrait has replaced Mugabe's in offices and shops across the country. Not so much a democratic coup, but a substitution of a personality cult. But the first major test of Nangara's and the post-Mugabe order is still coming. In either July or August, Zimbabweans will head to the polls to choose their next president. An official date has yet to be set, of course, but campaigning has already begun. Local and legislative elections will take place at the same time. The new man in charge is heading the ruling ZANU-PF party ticket, while the campaign slogan, Delivering the Zimbabwe You Want, promises something new. The campaign strategy is right out of the Mugabe playbook. A giant banner bearing Nangawa's likeness, clings to the side of Zanupuef's headquarters, the 15-storey Harare landmark located on a street named Rotten Row, and 52 luxury vehicles emblazed with the party logos were handed over to traditional leaders affiliated with the ruling party. Most analysts agree that this is the current president's election to lose. He is the incumbent, after all, and he enjoys a wave of popular goodwill for his role in Amsiti Mugabe, Without a hint of irony, ZANU-PF, the only ruling party Zimbabwe has ever known, is pitching itself as a party of change. Despite having served in every administration since 1980, Nangawa's may be seen as a new broom by some voters who are eager to see normalisation of relations with the West and the significant economic growth needed for jobs to return to absorb the country's indigenous workforce. At the same time, the election also represents the best chance the opposition has ever had of unseating ZANU-PF, if only they can land on an effective message. Zimbabweans are desperate for a long-awaited change, but with ZANU-PF promising to deliver the change that they need, the opposition has to pull out all the stops in grassroots organising to be able to convince citizens that they have the solutions to the country's pressing problems. For the opposition, against ZANU-PF, we have Nelson Chamisa. Now, Chamisa's supporters are from the MDC alliance, the party that was once autocratically, some would say, governed by Morgan Sangarai, who died of cancer. Now, his supporters are optimistic, and they're latching on to his vision, coined by the phrase, the bullet train, and contend that Tamisa's appeal among young voters will propel him to victory against ZANU-PF. In their words, the military junta is expected to run against Changarai, but of course, Jamisa is not Changarai, he's a whole new man. Zimbabweans between the ages of 18 and 40 make up about 60% of registered voters. That means that if Jamisa can win over the youth, he will have won the election. This is the logic of the bullet train rhetoric. Jamisa is positioning himself as a visionary, tech-savvy, thoroughly modern leader, in a stark contrast to both the 93-year-old who was removed last year, Mugabe, and the new president, the 75-year-old, who has replaced him. Now for Ngawa, it's letting his vision be challenged by a younger challenger. That could be seen as incredibly dangerous. 
Now, not only that, this acting president is facilitating one of the most open campaign environments in the history of modern Zimbabwe. That has promises, but it also has dangers for both him and his opponents. Allowing his opponents to operate freely, even inviting international observers to monitor the vote, does show that some positive signs have happened in the country. In the past, it's been difficult for opposition leaders, especially the now deceased Svangarai, to campaign in rural areas. Police would stop rallies or get campaign programs cancelled. But the new president has carried out reforms which have allowed his opponent to do campaigns and rallies in rural areas. The previous heavy-handedness of law enforcement agencies isn't currently being displayed. But of course we'll see. An election date is soon to be set. It is not in stone. And these reforms are yet to be seen as pure democracy rather than expediency, and a desire to see a boost in the economic prospects of Zimbabwe alone. (laughs) 